Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so we're going to kind of go to the other end of the spectrum here and uh, focus a little bit more on the older patients, not so much the polytrauma patients. A number of the articles uh, that were presented this year for the longitudinal assessment were focused on um, hip fractures in particular, which as we have all experienced and seen is a growing population uh, with a lot of new data coming out. And so I thought it would be good to try to summarize the articles that were all published in the last five years that focus primarily on femoral neck fractures, as there's still a fair amount of controversy over how to handle them sometimes. So um, what I want to do with this is we're going to take three of the articles focused on femoral neck fractures, and we're going to kind of break them down into their um, met the high points, uh, something that will hopefully be high yield for people who are preparing for the a longitudinal assessment exam, which just opened, uh, I think, today or tomorrow. And then also included in the included in the list of articles was uh, a summary of the Academy's clinical practice guidelines um, for hip fractures, which hopefully will tie a lot of things together for people. So the first paper we're going to go over is the FAITH trial, uh, which was published uh, in JAMA. Not too many orthopedic articles get published there. Um, and this is a this is an article that I remember learning about when I was a resident, so it was really nice to see it finally um, published. So this was an international multi-center prospective randomized trial, um, and they built it off of initially um, some survey information and meta-analyses, and they discovered that internationally there's still a fair amount of variation in how people handle uh, displaced femoral neck fractures in patients from 50 to 80 years old. Um, and there wasn't a lot of clarity in understanding functional outcomes and how to fix these patients. Um, and so they uh, decided to focus on um, comparing the sliding hip screw versus cannulated screws uh, in those patients that were getting fixed. Uh, because while there was some compelling biomechanical evidence, there wasn't a lot of very clear clinical evidence. So um, again, this was a really, really large RCT that included not only a mix of hospitals, but also a mix of high and low income countries, so you have resource variability. They included everyone over the age of 50 with both displaced and non-displaced femoral neck fractures. Um, they had a very impressive two-year follow-up, and while the surgeon and the patient were not blinded to the procedure, patient, the, the people who were reviewing x-rays and functional outcomes and bump, doing the functional assessments, they were blinded to, to the procedure. And their initial hypothesis was that the sliding hip screw overall would have a lower reoperation rate with a better functional outcome than Cancellus screws at two years, which is what the prevailing literature had suggested at the time. So all in all, they enrolled more than a thousand patients, which is I think incredible for an orthopedic surgical trial. And 90% uh, or so, 85-90% actually completed their full two-year follow-up. There was very, very little crossover. And um, during the adjudication phase, there was an acceptable reduction in the vast majority of patients. And most of these patients were treated with a closed reduction. So what did they find out? Well, um, as with many, many orthopedic trials, they actually did not find a substantial difference in a lot of uh, mortality um, type outcomes. Um, there's also really no difference in fracture healing overall. Um, no difference in medical events, no difference in the overall functional outcomes at two years. However, on a subgroup analysis, um, they did find some trends, uh, and we're going to get into some um, graphs about that. So what they did find overall was that the sliding hip screw did have a greater likelihood of a conversion to a total hip compared to cancellous screws. And on the other hand, cancellous screws actually had a higher likelihood of implant removal or exchange. So that was statistically significant. There was also a higher likelihood of AVN in the sliding hip screw, which had been suggested in prior studies um, compared to the cancellous screws, which was just barely uh, statistically significant. Though if you cohorted all of the reasons for reoperation, there really wasn't a difference. Um, so you can see here, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve and just to orient people, um, each of these little crosses is basically when an event happened. And um, over time, you look, so the sliding hip screw was slightly less of a reoperation rate um, than the uh, cancella screws here in blue, although statistically, the p value did not reach significant. So it was a trend, but not statistically significant in an appropriately powered study. 
Now, when they did the subgroup analysis, they really tried to figure out, well, are there certain characteristics of patients that um, benefited the most or, or were substantially affected by the sliding hip screw versus cancellous screws? And again, we go back to the forest plot that Dr. Scalero um, had explained in his talk. Um, patients who had a displaced femoral neck fracture here, which is favoring the sliding hip screw, patients with a basis cervical fracture here as well, and then patients who were active smokers seem to have less of a negative event, meaning reoperation rate or fixation failure, um, if they got a sliding hip screw. And that was the main um, significant finding that they had. So what are the take home points for this? Well, it seems that sliding hip screws, um, both sliding hip screws and cancellous screws are effective treatment options for uh, both non-displaced and displaced femoral neck fractures in people over 50. Although in sliding hip screws, there may be a higher risk of ABN and conversion to total hip. Also, in patients with displaced fractures, current smokers, and days of cervical fractures, sliding hip screws may be um, may have a lower risk of reoperation overall. Um, moving on to the next paper, the this was an interesting paper, and again, it was comparing internal fixation versus total hip fracture, uh, total hip arthroplasty, and femoral neck fractures. This was part, this was a different patient population. It was um, all geriatric, clearly geriatric, so over 70 uh, Swedish femoral neck fracture patients, all of whom were displaced. So unlike the previous paper, which kind of cohorted the displaced and non-displaced together, these are all displaced femoral neck fractures who were in an RCT from 15 years ago. So they had um, very, very long-term follow-up, and this is an updated report on their initial RCT. So um, they compared patients who um, all had displaced femoral neck fractures, and they either got a posterolateral lateral approach cemented total hip versus a two-pin open reduction or closed reduction internal fixation. And what is noticeable about this is that they actually included patients with dementia, which is about 20 25% of their included population, which a lot of other studies have specifically excluded, but as I think we can all see in our own clinical practice, is a pretty common patient to see. So they originally, and this is kind of sobering, uh, but not totally unsurprising, they, they enrolled a total of 140 patients, this is again 15 years ago, and 3% were alive at their final 15 year follow-up. And you can sort of see here, what I think they really brought to the literature that was helpful was the effect of mental impairment um, versus cognitively intact patients and how that affected outcomes. Um, so even though this is overall a relatively small study, I think this is why um, it has some important things to understand. So you can see here again a survival curve of patients as they were um, if, as they were followed longer and longer. The patients with mental impairment really do much much poorly, more, more poorly than the patients who had normal cognitive function over time. Um, they broke down the groups into the lucid uh, versus the mental impairment patients. Um, in the lucid patients, you can kind of see what I think we can all assume and uh, probably all agree upon now is that if you fix a displaced femoral neck fracture in a geriatric patient, even if they're lucid, they tend to have a very high rate of reoperation. Um, if you do a, some, an arthroplasty procedure, especially a total hip, the rate, rate of reoperation is much lower, although there is a risk of dislocation. And those patients who had dementia or some other cognitive impairment they do poorly in any situation, uh, regardless of if you decide to reduce and fix or if you do an arthroplasty. Um, a couple of other notable things. Um, one thing they commented on was that all patients actually lost weight after surgery, which I think a lot of us have probably seen as well. Um, poor appetite, lack of exercise, and lack of mobility. Um, but those who had a total hip actually regained their weight, which I think is in keeping with some of our more recent literature on functional recovery in patients who get total hip. Overall, there was a very low total hip um, failure rate in the lucid patients, but dementia was highly associated with failure for both uh, the total hip and ORIF. So my take home from these was for displaced femoral neck fractures in the elderly, cemented total hip is a much better option than internal fixation, and dementia is a strong predictor of failure no matter what you do in uh, these geriatric fractures. So this brings us to our last uh, paper, which is again a Scandinavian paper. Uh, it's a very well-designed prospective randomized controlled trial and, and I think does a good job trying to answer a question that we face 
still on a daily basis is what do you do with the valgus impacted or minimally displaced femoral neck fractures? Um, do you perk pin all of them or is, does arthroplasty have a role? Um, and I think this paper did a nice job of trying to help us understand. So um, all of us have seen patients where we've done what we thought was a good uh, percutaneous fixation of what seemed to be an appropriate um, appropriate fracture with valgus impaction or essentially non-displaced. But even then, there is a reasonable failure risk of anywhere from 5 to 10 percent. And there, were, there have not up until now been very, very good large clinical trials. So what these guys did was they took geriatric fracture patients with valgus impacted or non-displaced femoral neck. So based on the garden classification, which uh, it's important to notice only really looks at the AP and it does not really assess the lateral, which will come into play later. They had two year follow-up and had a very large number of outcomes they, they followed, including the Harris hip score, the timed up and go test, um, pain, as well as reoperation. And again, like the prior, um, study, the surgeon and the patient were not blinded to the procedure, but the research staff forming the functional assessments, we were blinded to the allocation. So ultimately, they enrolled 219 patients. Um, again, like the Swedish study, the people who got fixation only got two screws, which is pretty common in Europe. Um, patients who got hemiarthroplasty, the vast majority were a lateral approach and, and then and were cemented bipolar implants. And what they found was um, at two years, there was really no difference in function, and neither group actually made it back to their pre-injury function. Um, their pain was worst at the three months. However, those in the hemiarthroplasty group did have a better time to up and go at one or two years, so their mobility was better, and that was statistically significant. And they also found that their better global quality of life overall, but they also started off being better, so it's hard to draw any conclusions of that. Um, and one thing they noted from the medical complication aspect is that patients who underwent screw fixation were less likely to have pulmonary complications um, as they were looking into um, this concern over things like sudden cardiac collapse, which is a, is a very, very unlikely but very, very scary complication of a cemented hip. So um, this is a, a summary of their findings, and you can see here this um, likelihood of screw removal. And again, these are non-displaced or impacted was pretty high. So they had a 20% reoperation rate um, of which um, the vast majority were some sort of conversion to arthroplasty uh, compared to a 5% reoperation rate in the hemiarthroplasty um, group. Um, so that's a pretty striking, I think, finding. And what they did find when they actually looked more uh, carefully at the preoperative radiographs is this um, impact of the posterior tilt. So if you have a posterior tilt, which is not appreciated and not included on any of the commonly used um, fracture classification schema we have, then they are more, much more likely to uh, go on to develop reoperation or complications um, that might require an arthroplasty. And I think we can use this information to start considering posterior tilted fractures as a displaced fracture and not um, and closer to a garden three or four. Um, and then just as a um, global understanding of hip fractures, like so many other studies, they had 20% mortality at one year, which did not have any relationship to the implants they were used. So the take home, um, I think hemiarthroplasty of non-displaced or valgus impacted femoral neck fractures is a viable option and something to be considered more frequently now. Um, they definitely have a lower reoperation rate and uh, better mobility. Um, and in the patients with a posterior tilt, especially, um, I think that hemiarthroplasty is um, becoming a bit more and more a clear indication. Um, and then the last couple minutes here, I'm just gonna go very, very quickly through the clinical practice guideline summary. The, the actual clinical practice guideline is something like 110 pages, so we're not gonna do that, I'll spare you that. Um, but what I did was basically summarized and, and collated the strong recommendations, which is definitely, we should all be doing this. Um, and these are all just the recommendations specifically related to femoral neck fractures. Um, and then there are moderate recommendations, which you know we should all be doing um, as well, um, but there is a little bit more room for clinical judgment. And then there are weak recommendations, which uh, at this level, they don't have a lot of clear uh, data on. So, Things that are strongly, strongly recommended 
And hopefully, eventually, all of us can be doing as a standard of care for our hip fracture patients our preoperative regional anesthesia. Um, both general and spinal anesthesia have good evidence to support their safety and utility. And patients with a displaced or unstable, and I would include that posterior tilt group, um, should get a um, arthroplasty procedure in those femoral neck fracture patients. Other things that were strongly recommended that were more generalizable are um, investing in post-discharge uh, intensive PT, so considering that for patients, post-operative multimodal analgesia, and then developing an interdisciplinary care program, particularly those with uh, cognitive deficits, as we can see their outcomes tend to be much more, um, on, much, much more um, negative. The moderate um, recommendations, which have a fair amount of data, uh, but not nearly as conclusive, are uh, internal fixation for stable femoral neck fractures. Um, really, there's no difference between unipolar and bipolar arthroplasty uh, for the displaced fractures. Uh, cementing is still has a fairly um, compelling data that it prevents a late or immediate perioperative fracture. Um, it still also seems to be fairly consistent in the data that posterior approaches have a higher dislocation rate, though the overall for uh, dislocation rate is still relatively low. And in selected patients, a total hip arthroplasty for functional improvement may be better for those patients with the displaced or unstable femoral necks. Um, here is a list of other um, moderate uh, recommendations. I think a lot of people are already doing this, which is um, early surgery, um, PTOT through the continuum of care, even after the acute postoperative period, uh, evaluation of nutrition, calcium and vitamin D supplementation, osteoporosis, own the bone kind of concepts, um, and surprisingly preoperative traction, which I did not expect to have a moderate recommendation. Um, but it is, um, it is something that I think if you already have that in your practice does have some evidence to support. Uh, and then also the utility of MRI to rule out an occult fracture. Things that do not really have great data behind them uh, and are subject to clinical judgment is routine nutritional screening of patients and um, early surgery, even though, even in the patient who are on antiplatelet agents. Um, although I think that for most people, um, that is becoming the standard where even if you're on aspirin or Plavix or any of the other new antiplatelets, we tend to ignore them and then proceed with the procedure anyway to keep it under 48 hours. Uh, so at that, I know it's a lot of data to assimilate, but I'll open up for questions from the other panelists or Dr. Barris. So I just had one question for you, Carol. Uh, the one thing you didn't mention in your excellent review, uh, how do you personally choose between hemiarthroplasty and total hip arthroplasty? So that is a very uh, difficult question because the, uh, the prevailing data is not totally clear on who should get it. We all say someone who is quote unquote more active um, there are even places that say if you think they're going to live longer than two years, which I don't know how any orthopedic surgeon is supposed to know that, but um, I tend to go um, first by functional status. So if they're primarily homebound, if they're walker bound, or if they're in a nursing home, then all the data says that hemiarthroplasty has a lower dislocation rate, has less blood loss, and I think a lot more people are comfortable with it as well. Um, and I, I preferentially cement uh, my hemiarthroplasties uh, for osteoporotic patients. Um, now, if patients are um, still regularly exercising, if they walk a half mile a day, if they um, travel, and if they physiologically are pretty robust, then that is my indication for a total hip arthroplasty, regardless of age. Because uh, you can have 85-year-olds who are still um, going to Zumba every day and working out and they walk a mile and it's not a problem for them. And you can have 65 year olds with renal disease and diabetes who really just go to the grocery store a couple times a week. So I really gauge it on activity level. Um, if patients have any amount of dementia or cognitive impairment, then I will not, I do not consider them good candidates for a total hip arthroplasty. Great, thanks. All right, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Julius Bishop.